Hi, and welcome back to Fundamentals of Bioinformatics. This is part three of my lecture series on sequence homology searching. In this lecture, we're going to wrap up our discussion of algorithms for sequence homology searching, and we're going to focus on uh, an important aspect of this, which is determining if a sequence alignment is statistically significant. Now, we've used the alignment score a little bit so far, um, primarily uh, just in the last exercise as one of the ways, uh, or sorry, in the last lecture, just as one of the ways of determining which of a series of pairwise alignments is the best. Um, today, we're gonna spend some more time talking about the score and uh, specifically how we use that score to determine statistical significance. Now, when we do a pairwise sequence alignment, the, the results, including the score, are a bit hard to interpret. We don't necessarily know when we align a pair of sequences if it's a good score or if it's a bad score that we get back from, uh, from that alignment. Part of the reason for this is the score is dependent on a lot of the features of the sequences being aligned themselves. Um, so you may notice that, um, you know, if you were to look at those algorithms like Needleman, Wench, or Smith, Waterman, the score has the potential to be strongly impacted by the length of those sequences. Um, so for example, if you have two short sequences, uh, you're likely to obtain lower scores than if you have two long sequences, if in both cases the sequences are, say, roughly equally similar to each other. Um, the score can also depend on the substitution matrix that you're using. So some substitution matrices may have um, uh, may have higher scores for mismatch or for matches than others. They may have lower scores for mismatches than others. And so depending on which algorithm or which substitution matrix you're using, you may end up with scores that are higher or lower. Um, Let's see, what else? Um, uh, yeah, finally, um, the sequences themselves can impact the score that you're getting back from an alignment. Um, and so if you are looking at, say, a pair of protein sequences, um, depending on what amino acid residues show up in there, you could end up with a higher score than, another, um, than from another pair of sequences um, if there are just different amino acid compositions in there. Um, and so, for example, if you have some of the amino acids that are associated with higher scores in the Blossom 50 matrix, um, you may end up with a higher scoring alignment than if just, say, by chance, you are comparing sequences that have fewer of those high scoring um, amino acids. Um, and when I say high scoring amino acids, what I really mean is um, amino acids that have lots of high scores associated with them. Um, so when we compare um, a pair of sequences, um, we are really trying to um, interpret that alignment score to, to ask, what fraction of the time would I obtain a score at least this good if my sequences are not homologous? So recall that um, one of the main purposes of a sequence alignment is to um, identify homology between pairs of sequences. And so in that context, this um, sounds a lot like um, the definition of a p-value that you have learned about in your statistics classes. Um, so uh, if we frame this in, in those sorts of terms, um, our null hypothesis when we're doing a sequence alignment is that the sequences we're comparing are not homologous with one another. The alternative hypothesis then is that the sequences are homologous with one another. And so then the p-value is the fraction of time that you would obtain a score at least as good if the sequences are not homologous. Um, and so uh, that essentially is telling you um, how often you would be incorrect if you um, chose to accept the alternative hypothesis given a certain alignment score. 
Now, the other term that I want to remind you of here, um, and which I'm sure you learned about in your statistics courses, is alpha. And alpha is the threshold that is used for defining um, what the p-value tells us about the hypotheses. Um, and so if your alpha, uh, sorry, if your p is less than alpha, that means that you accept the alternative hypothesis. And so a common value for alpha um, is p equals zero, or sorry, alpha equals 0 0.05. Um, and so if you had a p-value, say, of 0 0.01, in that case, you would accept the alternative hypothesis. And so in other words, you would say that your sequences are homologous. If your alpha was um, uh, if your alpha was 0 0.05 and you obtained a p-value of 0.1, then you would reject the you would sorry you would fail to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Um, and so what that means is that you have not gathered enough evidence to say that your sequences are homologous. Um, a very important point here to remember is that a high p-value does not mean that you are accepting the null hypothesis. Um, so a high p-value doesn't mean, for example, that the sequences are not homologous. It just means that you have not uh, created enough or you do not have enough evidence to show that the sequences are homologous. The way that I often think about this um, is that there are a lot of causes for why you might get a low p-value. So for example, if your sequences are very short, um, so for example, like, you know, if you're comparing just five amino acids from a pair of hemoglobin sequences, maybe you're not gonna get um, a p-value that supports the idea that the sequences are homologous. But because those sequences are so short, you don't necessarily know that they're not homologous. You just don't have enough evidence yet to say that they are. Um, and so that's an example of why a in a statistical test such as this, we are never accepting the null hypothesis. We are uh, determining whether we can accept the alternative hypothesis. Um, now, the other thing that I, the other couple of terms that I want to introduce here um, are type one error and type two error. So a type one error is a false positive. And so in our example, that would mean that we say two sequences are homologous when they're not homologous with one another. On the other hand, um, the other type of error that we can get is a type two error, which would be a false negative. So with a false negative, we would say that two sequences are not homologous when they are homologous with one another. Um, and now whether your analysis is more likely to turn up false positives or false negatives depends on what value you choose for alpha. And so I like to think of alpha um, as sort of like a volume knob um, on, uh, on a stereo, for example. Um, and so like imagine you have this dial and you can turn alpha down or you can turn alpha up. And so if you turn alpha down and so you're going to a lower threshold, so like maybe you're going down to um, 0 0.00001 you're gonna end up having more type two error, or more false negatives. Um, the reason for that is you're gonna to have to have a really low p-value for it to be less than alpha. Um, and so you, um, by turning the knob that low, you bias your analysis toward more false positives. If you turn the dial the other way, so you set your alpha really high. So let's say you, you set your alpha to um, 0.1. That means you're gonna have more false positives um, because a higher p-value, for example, a p-value of 0 0.08 is going to um, uh, result in um, you calling those sequences homologous with one another. Um, and so there's not necessarily, um, one of these types of errors is not necessarily better than the other. 
Um, so for example, it's not necessarily better to always have, um, say, more false negatives or more false positives. It really depends a lot on what you're trying to do with that information. We'll come back to this a little bit more um, throughout the semester, um, particularly when we get to our machine learning section. Um, but I just want you to keep this in mind. So like in your stats class, especially if you have only taken say like one or two introductory statistics courses, you probably focused on um, having a fixed value of alpha, often 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. Um, but as you um, move into starting to apply this um, in the real world in analyses that you're doing or other applications, um, know that there is fluidity in how you choose alpha and you have control over what you're gonna bias yourself towards, either false negatives or false positives. It's always worth thinking about when you're choosing your value of alpha, which one is a more acceptable outcome is a false negative a more acceptable outcome or is a false positive a more acceptable outcome um, so now what i want to do is i want to jump over to a jupyter notebook and i want to continue um, with uh, working through some of the code from the sequence homology searching uh, chapter um, specifically what we're going to do here is we are going to um, develop an approach for computing a p-value from sequence alignments. Okay, so I have just started up my Jupyter Notebook server, um, and I am picking up with the code from the sequence homology searching chapter. And the first thing that I'm doing here, um, and again, I encourage you to follow along and run this on your own, um, for example, using the binder service that is connected to the book. Um, and so the first thing that I'm doing here is I am defining a function that is going to give me a random sequence um, of a given molecule type and a given length. And so I'm just gonna define that and then I'm gonna run this twice. Um, and so what I'm doing here is I'm defining my molecule type as DNA um, and the uh, sequence length as 50. Um, and so, um, for example, you can see here, I'm getting a, fifth, a length 50 sequence. Um, this is the sequence below. Um, and just as something to look at here, this is 56% um, GC content. Um, and we can compare that with this other random sequence that I've generated, which is now 40% GC content, same length, clearly different sequence. Let's just do that a couple more times just so you can see a few more of these. Um, so just a couple more random sequences. Um, if we were to change this, say, um, to go to 150, um, we would get a longer sequence. Um, if we change this, for example, to give us an RNA sequence, um, we would get RNA instead. And um, if we wanted a random protein sequence, we could change that to be protein. Um, but in this exercise, we are gonna work with DNA sequences and I'm just gonna leave that as 50 to get us started. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, create another function here called shuffle sequence. Um, and what this does is it takes a sequence's input and it randomizes the order of that sequence. Um, and so for example, if I generate a random seek and I call the uh, random sequence and I call that seek here, so again, this is DNA, 50 nucleotides, um, and then I call shuffle sequence and I provide that random sequence that I just generated as input. Uh oh, um, okay, so you can see I just got this name error when I tried to run that. What happened here is I forgot to run this cell where I defined shuffle sequence. So let me do that again. Um, and then I can just come down here. You can see I now ran shuffle sequence and now I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna run that. Um, and so you can see here that this sequence is clearly different now. Um, and so this one starts with GGGT, this one starts with TTTG, um, which is kind of a um, <laughs> interesting coincidence. But um, each of these is 48% um, 
GC. And so um, we just uh, can see that the composition of this sequence is the same. The, um, it's just that the order of the nucleotides is different. Um, I'll shuffle that one more time. So we're shuffling the same sequence again. Here you can see it starts with uh, CGAA, um, still 48% GC content. Okay, so one thing that you might be wondering is, um, okay, so like, am I just gonna use something like a uh, Z test here, for example, to figure out what the distribution of sequence um, alignment scores are, and then figure out if my alignment score is an outlier from that distribution. Um, so you may remember the z-test. It's usually one of the first ones that you learn about in a statistics class, and you're basically figuring out how many how many standard deviations away from the mean is my value um, uh, from some uh, the mean of some distribution of that value. Um, this relies on that value. Um, so, for example, a good example of this would be, say, um, height of 20-year-old individuals in the United States. Um, and so, um, if you want to know if uh, somebody is taller than uh, taller than average in a significant way, then you could figure out what that distribution looks like of all heights of 20-year-olds in the United States figure out that individual's height, how, figure out how many standard deviations they are away from the mean there, um, and then that'll tell you if this individual is, um, say, significantly taller or shorter than the average. Um, so that relies on having that distribution of heights, and it relies on that distribution being normal. Um, and so in other words, um, the mean being roughly the most common value um, and then uh, sort of following a bell curve um, in both directions from that mean. Well, we don't know what the distribution of scores looks like for a pairwise sequence alignment. Um, so for example, you know, we don't know what the mean is expected to be, and we certainly don't know if the distribution of scores is normal. Um, and in many cases, um, outside of a few examples from, um, you know, that are common in statistics courses, the um, uh, normal distributions are really not very common. And so we um, typically would violate that assumption of normality. Uh, and so another way to think about this is to determine what those scores would look like if the, um, uh, uh, if the null hypothesis were true. Um, and so in our example here, if sequences are not homologous with one another, what kind of scores would we see or what would we expect to see? And we can do that using random sequences and we're gonna look at how now. Um, so imagine that again, I have um, I'm gonna call this my query sequence. It's gonna be a random sequence. And then just to see what this looks like, um, what I'm gonna do is I am going to call our pairwise align function. So that's that local pairwise align SSW. I'm just gonna align this against itself. And so this is the best possible alignment score that we could get for um, sequences that look like our query sequence. And so in other words, are the same length um, and have the same composition. So the same, say, GC content, for example, as a measure of uh, composition. Um, now, if I want to know, um, so like that is kind of like the extreme case here, um, is that I have aligned this query sequence against itself. Um, and so I know that these sequences are 100% identical. Um, imagine that I wanted to um, look at sequences, say that I know are non-homologous from one another and see what those scores look like. Um, what I could do, I'm actually just going to copy this cell um, and I am going to then um, 
paste it in here. And I'm going to do something a little bit um, different this time. I'm going to call this query seek one. And then I'm going to define another query seek, which I'm going to call query seek two. And so now recall that these are going to be two different random sequences here. Um, and so if I now try and align query seek one and query seek two to one another, we'll see what an alignment score looks like for sequences that are not homologous with one another. So you can see much different result here. We're getting a score of 12. Um, and so what we would typically want to do if we were trying to contextualize an alignment score that we're getting so like we want to contextualize this score of 100 or we want to contextualize this score of 12 what we would want to do is generate a bunch of scores for alignments that we know are not homologous with one another and so we can do that like i did here where we are just generating two sequences uh, at random so the next thing I'm going to do in order to help me contextualize those scores is I'm going to define a function called generate random score distribution. And what this is going to do is it's going to take two sequences as input. And these would be the two sequences that I might want to compare to one another. Um, it's going to take a number of iterations. It's going to take our aligner. I'll come back to that number of iter iterations in a few minutes. Um, but what this is going to do is it's going to create a list of alignment scores. Um, and what it's the way it's going to do that is it's going to um, perform n iterations. And in each iteration, it's going to shuffle sequence one. And so remember that shuffle sequence is going to shuffle the order of the nucleotides in that sequence. Um, and it's going to save that to a new variable called random sequence. It's then going to align random sequence against sequence two as it was provided as input and grab that score, append it to our list of scores, and then this will return scores when it's all done. Um, and so basically what we're doing here is we are aligning sequence two against n shuffled versions of sequence one. And so what that's going to do is it's going to give us the distribution of scores between these two, um, between uh, sequence two and a lot of sequences that look like sequence one because they have the same composition, the exact same number of A's, C's, G's, and T's, but we know they're not homologous to sequence two because we've randomized the order of them. And so then that is gonna give us an idea of what the distribution of scores looks like for two sequences like these that uh, are not homologous with one another. And so I'll define that function and then I'll call it. Um, and so I'm calling it here, aligning query seek against query seek. And so this is that first query seek that I defined up here that we initially aligned against itself. Um, and so this is now giving me the scores for doing that sort of randomized, excuse me, that randomized alignment approach. Um, and so you can see I've got scores like 11, 10, 12, 14, 13, 10, 12, a um, couple that are lower like 8. I see maybe the highest one in here is 19. Um, and like we have gotten in the habit of doing when we want to look at something like this, um, we can generate a plot of it. Um, and so um, what we can do here is... Um, I realized, okay, I, I realized I messed something up here um, a little bit above. Um, so I'm just going to rerun. So what I did here was um, when I aligned query seek one and query seek two, I assigned those to this variable actual score. Um, but I was overwriting the actual score of aligning query seek to query seek. Um, and so I am going to run that cell again. Um, and so you can see I ran that again. Um, I got that score of 100. 
and I'm gonna come down here and plot that distribution again. And so now what this is showing is the this distribution here of all of these random scores are what we're seeing in this like uh, purplish color over here. Um, and so you can see like they kind of range between about 10 and 20. Um, and then I have the actual score that we received from aligning these two sequences with one another. Um, and so if we move back up, um, you can see that was this score of 100 that I obtained up top there. Um, and so what you can see is without us having to know anything about what alignment scores might look like for these sequences in advance, um, we can see that this value that we got from actually aligning our sequences is clearly an outlier from the distribution of these random sequences. Um, okay, so um, now we are moving down here and I think this function may have been duplicated in here. So this looks like, yeah, this looks like the exact same uh, function that I had above. Um, and so it doesn't hurt to have it in there again. I'm just gonna go ahead and delete that. Um, but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to generalize this a little bit. Um, and so um, I'm going to call that generate random scores distribution, but I'm just going to also build in computing the actual score here. And that'll just make things a little bit easier for us. Um, and so I'm still going to provide sequence one, sequence two, my number of iterations. But now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to align sequence one and sequence two to one another. I'm then going to call that generate random scores distribution. And so that's going to give me those random scores. Um, so again, aligning random, sh random shuffled versions of sequence one against the actual sequence two 99 times. Um, that'll give me this list. And then what I'm going to do is count the number of times the random scores are at least as good as our actual score. Um, and so um, we're going to keep track of that in this variable called count better. And we're going to say for s in random scores, if s is greater than or equal to the actual score, then we'll increase count better by one. And so what that means, so we're gonna iterate through all of these random scores and we're gonna compare actual score to each one. And so if the random score is greater than or equal to the actual score, we tally up that we have one random score that is better. Um, we then are going to, um, this is kind of a little confusing the way this works here, um, but we are going to add one to count better and we're gonna add one to N and we're gonna return that. Um, and the reason that we're doing that is because we are trying to tally up all of the scores that we computed in this function. And so that includes actual score. And so um, the actual score here is greater than or equal to itself. So it's equal to itself. Um, and so it goes in the numerator here. Um, and then we add one to the denominator to account for the fact that we have done one more score or one more alignment than uh, the number of random alignments that we do. Um, this is um, just convenient for interpreting the value that we get back. And it's sort of just a convention for how um, this is done. And so I'm gonna do that. Um, and now if I call this, um, I can say, um, if I align query seek against query seek, so again, I'm aligning something against itself. Um, this is telling me that the fraction of alignment scores that are at least as good as the actual alignment score is 0 0.01. And so that accounts for that one um, that we put in there. 
Um, and again, this is sort of just the convention of how this is done. Um, and this is um, our this is um, our p-value that we would get for this test. And the way that you would report this p-value, and I cover this in the text, um, is you would say that your p is less than 0 0.01 for this test. Um, you know that it's less than that because we never actually observed a random score that was greater than or equal to the actual score. And so we would say it's less than 0 0.01. Um, now, another thing to be aware of with N, and I said I would come back to this in a few minutes, is the resolution that we can get in our p-value is directly tied to the value of N. Um, and so if we have 99 iterations, the lowest value we can get here is 0 0.01. But if we have 999 um, iterations, the um, lowest p-value we can get, um, we get one extra decimal place in there to the right. And so now the lowest p-value we can get is 1 1,000th. Um, and so that 1 1,000th, again, corresponds to that actual score that we got when we aligned the input sequence against itself. Um, okay, so let's generate um, another couple of random sequences. And so here we'll generate random sequence one. This time we'll go 250 bases. And now I'm gonna generate a, another sequence here. And so now this is random sequence or sequence two. Um, and so what do you expect is going to happen if I align these against one another? Are we going to get a significant p-value um, or are we not going to get a significant p-value? And so um, if we say uh, consider um, alpha of 0 0.05 to be our significance threshold, where are we going to end up here? Um, well, I think you probably guess that this is going to be an insignificant p-value. Um, because these are two totally randomly generated sequences. Um, and so if I run that, um, you can see that this is saying the fraction of alignment score is at least as good as the alignment score, the actual alignment score, is 0.75. And so that corresponds to P equals 0 0.75. Um, and so that is not so good. That is not a significant alignment. Um, and you can see this is now kind of like the opposite extreme of the example that we were looking at before, where we um, are now aligning sequences that we know are not homologous and we're getting an insignificant p-value. Um, and so uh, based on these two things that we've done here, when we align sequences, we absolutely know are homologous because we have defined them uh, the same then we get a significant p-value. When we're aligning sequences that we absolutely know are not homologous because we generated them independently at random, then we're getting a uh, p-value that says that these are not significantly, um, they, that they are not, uh, we're getting a, sorry, an insignificant p-value, um, which tells us that we don't have evidence that these sequences are homologous with one another. Um, so let's do something a little bit harder here. Um, let's cover this middle ground. Um, so like sequences are, are um, definitely not homologous. Sequences definitely are homologous. Um, what happens if we just partially randomize a sequence? Um, and so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna define another function that will take a percent identity and a sequence. And what it's going to do is it is going to um, uh, make some substitutions in that sequence so that the resulting sequence is roughly um, percent identity, uh, percent ID identical to the input sequence. Um, and so if I define this um, and then I call this, I can um, generate, say, sequence one and then sequence 195. And so what I did here was I said um, sequence 195 
goes to partially randomized sequence with a percent identity of 0.95. And so what this function is then doing is it is making mutations or substitutions at about 5% of the positions in this sequence. And so if you scan through these, um, you may start to see some differences. Um, and so here I see one right away. Um, the third base here is a C after um, going through this partial randomization, where before it was an A. Um, and so now what do you think is gonna happen? So if I align these sequences to one another, um, do you think I'm gonna get a significant p-value or an insignificant p-value? Well, let's run it and find out. Um, so if I run that, um, you can see that the fraction of alignment scores that are at least as good as the actual is 0 0.01. And so that's really cool. So we, we have made some modifications to the sequence, but we've kept it almost entirely the same. This function that we defined for creating these p-values considers that to still be a significant alignment. So that, that's good. Um, it seems like this is working. What if we now do um, call that partially randomized with 25%? Um, and so now we see sequence one, and then we see sequence one, 25. Um, and so now you see there's much more difference between these sequences. Um, like I can already see, um, that the first three bases of these sequences are different from one another. So we're getting a lot more substitution events. Now, what do you think? Is this algorithm going to be able to um, say that, is this algorithm gonna say that these are significant or insignificant? Um, let's go ahead and run that. And you can see that in this case, the fraction of alignment scores that are at least as good is 0.51 and so we have a p of 0.51 and so this is interesting now because we actually know that these sequences are homologous with one another but what you can think of uh, this as is that these are very distantly related sequences maybe like there are just an enormous amount of substitutions um, between these sequences and at this point we are not able to detect homology anymore using this approach. Um, and so um, what that suggests is that at some point we are going to hit the limit of being able to identify homology with alignment of nucleotide sequences. Um, and so the last thing I want to do in this lecture is I want to explore what that limit of detection is. So how similar or how dissimilar do two sequences um, need to be before this approach stops identifying them as homologous sequences? Um, and so the way that I'm going to do that is I am going to define a range of percent identities um, between zero and one in steps of 5% or 0 0.05. Um, at each percent identity, I'm gonna define 20 sequences. I'm gonna make those sequences 150 bases long. Um, and then for each of these percent identities, I am going to um, do this alignment test and I'm gonna report back the percent identity between the query and the subject and then the median p-value and the mean p-value for this test. And so I'm gonna go ahead and run this, and this one might just take a minute to run because this is actually doing um, a lot of sequence alignments now. Um, remember that for each, um, uh, for each statistical test we're doing, um, we're computing 100 alignments. And so um, with, uh, 20 sequences and 20% identities, um, we are doing a lot of alignments there. And it looks like that just completed. Um, okay, so here's my table. This is the percent identity between the query and the subject, median p-value and mean p-value. And so what I wanna know is when do we stop seeing um, significant p-values? 
Um, and so if we scroll down through here, um, like if, so I'm looking like at the um, means here, I'm looking at the medians. Um, the median is gonna be less sensitive to outliers. And so we can focus on that. And you can see that like when we start getting to this range around here of around 40 or 45%, this approach is not able to detect that homology anymore. Um, and so that suggests that if we have sequences that are homologous, but are have undergone so many mutations um, between them, we're gonna hit the limit of an approach like this. Um, and we might not be able to use nucleotide alignment anymore to be able to do um, homology detection between sequences. Now, as you know, um, you can have mutations in a um, nucleotide sequence that are synonymous, meaning that if this is a protein coding region, they don't change the amino acid. Um, and so it's possible that when you start getting down to these lower ranges of pairwise identity with nucleotides, you might wanna do protein alignment because you may uh, end up with fewer substitutions between those protein sequences than between the nucleotide sequences. And so you might be able to detect homology going a little bit deeper back in time. Similarly, you can sometimes have mutations in a protein um, that don't necessarily impact the structure of the protein. Um, and so, for example, if you substitute some of those very similar amino acids for one another, you might not disrupt the protein structure. And so if you are sort of at the limit of being able to detect a protein sequence alignment, or sorry, homology with a protein sequence alignment, um, it may be time to try and look at structures of those proteins if you know what they are and determine if um, there's evidence for homology there. Um, okay, so that wraps up the chapter on sequence homology searching. Um, so I will leave it there. Um, again, I recommend that you work through the examples in this chapter by running this notebook, um, and that will help you solidify some of these ideas. There's a lot covered in this chapter, but it's really important stuff in bioinformatics. All right, thanks for your time, and I will see you next time.